Hello everyone. My topic is Valley of the Drums, which occurred in Bullock County, Kentucky. The purpose of this research is to provide an overview of the story for Valley of the Drums and give you some context. We'll also take a deeper dive to further understand the harmful agents that were used and the impact on the environment. This is the table of contents, which we will go through as we continue the presentation. So, what was it? Valley of the Drums was a toxic waste site in Bullock County, Kentucky, as noted uh, on the red dot on the map, which is just south of the industrial city Louisville. Many companies from Louisville would often come to the site to dump their contents in open pits and trenches at, created by the property owner. It was said that there's over 17,000 drums containing hazardous waste at this site. It's worth mentioning that it was uncontrolled. From 1967 to 1977, this site was unregulated and unreported. The Superfund law was not created until 1980 as a result of this site and Love Canal. So, who was the property owner? Well, his name was Arthur Taylor and he was an entrepreneur. He emptied waste contents into these open pits and trenches to later resell the drums back to companies. Mr. Taylor never reported his actions to the local or state government and unfortunately died in 1978, one year before the EPA regarded him as a person responsible. Whose waste was it? The site became a common dumping ground for paint and coating industries in the Louisville area. I thought this slide was interesting because I recognized some of these companies, Ford Motor, Monsanto, Chevron Oil. And when these companies were asked by publicists about what had happened, why their, their drums were located at the site, they stated that they had no idea and could not comment on the topic. This likely is due to the fact that there were no permits at the time and they didn't have to answer to anyone. This is a nice timeline of events to show um, when the site was created in 1967. In 1975, something interesting happened when a drum caught fire for almost a week. This was the first time the public became aware of this site and the EPA began its investigation in 1979. Um, in 1980, like I said, the Superfund law was created as a result of this site. However, the site didn't end up on the MPL list until 1983. So it took quite a bit of time for the site to get cleaned up. What was being dumped? Well, there were PCBs, polychlorinated biphenyls, which are toxic industrial chemicals, was a commonly used ingredient in paints and coatings in the 1960s, as well as volatile organic compounds and heavy metals. The chart on the left shows the parts per million of PCBs allowed in food and water, as they are everywhere in the environment. We don't live without them, so there's never a chance of it being zero. Um, there's also the short-term exposure limits and permissible exposure limits for these toxic agents. So why were people using these PCBs and hazardous chemicals if they knew they weren't good for you? Well, commercial companies, they had a very appealing aspect to them. There was a high degree of chemical stability, low flammability, high heat capacity, and they weren't conductors. So from a commercial standpoint, they did everything that someone would want. The slide is nice because it shows a depiction of these unregulated drums, maybe not maintained very well. You can see there's some rusting on them and they are leaking into the ground, which goes into the groundwater, into the soil, and eventually who who's eating these chemicals? Marine life. Unfortunately, the biomagnification of PCBs in marine life is an issue that we are still dealing with today. PCBs get stored in fat cells, and as you go up the food chain, predatory fish accumulate very high concentrations of PCBs. This is especially common in farmed salmon. This is becoming a world issue that we are struggling with. So like I said, PCBs do not break down easily. 
they remain in the environment for a very long time, which adds to the spread of these agents. As they remain in the environment, they are getting into the water supply and are ending up in places where there's not even corporations or commercial in industries in general. Um, they're found in polar bears on the Arctic Circle. PCBs accumulate in marine life, which increases their toxicity levels to humans. Um, exposure to PCBs can cause skin rashes. That's a common result of them. But there are also links to liver damage, anemia, thyroid issues, reproductive issues, and cancer. This chart shows you how many PCBs have been eliminated globally and the amount that still exists today. So as you can see, it's very difficult to destroy these agents. How do we destroy them? Well, not very common, but they can be destroyed by incineration at extremely high heats, as well as thermal desorption, which is incineration at very low levels, but it's quite dangerous and expensive. Um, there are chemical ways to destroy it. Again, it takes a very long time. Um, I thought it was worth noting there are research um, in microbial and fungal methods of destruction. So they take a long time, but this could be a nice way to progress the technology and create some sort of sustainable cycle with PCB destruction. Cleanup took a long time, and it's still occurring today. In 1979, the EPA began the cleanup. However, they later developed a formal plan in 1986. Uh, thousands of drums were removed. It's said that it cost over $10 million to clean up this site. Trenches were built to avoid leaking the contents into groundwater and decrease soil erosion. A plan was developed to monitor Wilson Creek so that the contents would not further spread into the Ohio River. And in 1990, KDEP took control of the site. They started maintaining, monitoring, and developed five-year review plans. So while the site remains non-operational, the repercussions of this site still remain today. The Superfund Act of 1980 was developed as a result of this environmental disaster. Um, and the site was removed from the MPL list in 1996. PCB manufacturing was banned in the United States in 1979, and production is no longer allowed under the Stockholm Convention. This is a global treaty that aims to protect the environment and health of humans from PCBs and persistent organic pollutants. It calls upon parties to phase out the use of PCBs by 2025 and eliminate complete use by 2028. It's worth noting that the USA is not part of this treaty. This is an image of what the site looks like today. Very tranquil, fenced off, not used for anything, and regularly monitored. You would never know that this was once one of the most toxic dumping grounds in the United States. Well, that's it. Thank you for listening, and I hope you enjoyed the story of the Valley of the Drums.